Ashley Brock here with Nora Roberts' next book in her series. It's called Inner Harbor, and it's Philip's story. And I have to admit, I like Cam and Anna's. It's cutesy, and it's it's everything. It's fucking... I love Cam and Anna. And Ethan and Grace's story is cutesy in some parts, and, and very super emotional. Uh, but Philip's is not only cutesy but it's also funny and i would have to say out of the four books i like this story the best it's my favorite so here is nora roberts book inner harbor prologue philip quinn died at the age of 13 since the overworked and underpaid staff at the baltimore city hospital emergency room zapped him back in less than 90 seconds he wasn't dead very long as far as he was concerned, it's plenty long enough. What had killed him briefly was two twenty-five caliber bullets, twenty-five caliber bullets pumped out of a Saturday night special shoved through the open window of a stolen Toyota Celica. The finger on the trigger had belonged to a close personal friend, or as near to a close personal friend as a thirteen-year-old thief could claim on Baltimore's bad streets. The bullets missed his heart, not mu not by much. But in later years, Philip considered it just, it just far enough. That heart, young and strong, though sadly jaded, continued to beat as he lay there, pouring blood over the used condoms and crack vials in the stinking gutter on the corner of Fayette and Paca. The pain was obscene, like sharp, burning icicles stabbing in his chest. But the grinning pain refused to take him under until the release of unconsciousness. He lay awake and aware, hearing the screams of other victims of, or bystanders, the squeal of brakes, the revving of engines, and his own ragged and rapid breasts. He just forced a small haul of electronics that he'd stolen from a 30-story walk-up less than four blocks away. He had $250 in his pocket and had swaggered down to score a dime bag to help him get through the night. Since he'd just been sprung from a 90 days in juvie for another B&E that hadn't gone quite so smoothly, he'd been out of the loop. And out of cash. Now appeared he was out of luck. <laughs> Later he would return. Remember thinking, shit, oh shit, this hurts. <laughs> but he couldn't seem to wrap his mind around another thought. He'd gotten in the way. He knew that. The bullets hadn't been meant for him in particular. Got a glimpse of the gang callers in that frozen three seconds before the gun had fired. His own callers. When he bothered to associate, say, associate himself with one of the gangs that roamed the streets and alleys of the city. If he hadn't just popped out of the system, he wouldn't have been on that corner at that moment. He would have been told to stay clear, and he wouldn't now be sprawled out, pumping blood and staring into the dirt mud, dirty mouth of the gutter. Lights flashing, blue, red, white. Scream of sirens pierced through human screams. Cops! Even though... Even through the slick haze of pain, his instincts were was to run. His mind sprang up, young, agile, street smart, and melted into the shadows. Even the effort of the thought of cold sweat sliding down his face. He felt a hand on his shoulder, fingers probed until they reached the thirty pulse in his throat. This one's breathing. Get the paramedics over here. Someone turned him over. The pain was unspeakable, but he couldn't release the scream. That rifle through his head. His old faces swimming over him. The hard eyes of a cop, the grim ones of the medical technician. Red, blue, and white lights burned his eyes. Someone wept in high, keening sobs. Hang in there, kid. Why? He wanted to ask why. It hurt to, it hurt to be there. He was never going to escape as he once promised himself he would. What was life of his left of his life was running right into the gutter. What had come before was only ugliness. What was now, what was now was only pain. What was the damn point? He went away for a while, sinking down below the pain where the world was dark and dingy red. From somewhere outside his world came the shriek of the sirens, the pressure of his chest, the speeding motion of the ambulance. Then lights again. Bright white to sheer his closed eyes, and he was flying while voices shouted on all sides of him. Pull the wound, chest, BPs, 80 over 50, and filing, and pulse threading rapid, in and out. Pupils are good. Type and cross match. We need pictures. One, three. One, three. One, two, three. His body seemed to jerk up and then down. He no longer cared. Even the dig 
G Red was going gray. Tube was pushed its way down his throat, and he didn't bother to try to cuff it up. Barely felt it. Barely felt anything. Thank God for it. BP's dropping. We're losing him. I've been lost a long time, he thought. With big interest, he watched them half a dozen green suited people in a small room where a tall blonde boy lay on a table. Blood was everywhere. His blood, he realized. He was on the table with his chest tore open. He looked down at himself. With detached sympathy, no more pain now, and a quiet sense of relief nearly made him smile. He floated higher until the scene below took on a barely sheen, and the sounds were nothing but echoes. And the pain tore through him, a abrupt shock that made the body on the table jerk, it sucked him back. He struggled to pull away. His struggle to pull away was brief and fruitless. He was inside again, filled again, lost again. Next thing he knew, he was riding in a drug haze blur. Someone was snoring. The room was dark and the bed narrow and hard. A backwash of light filtered through a pane of glass that was spotted with fingerprints. Machines beeped and sucked monotonously. One and only escaped the sounds. He rolled back under. He was in and out for two days. He was very lucky, that's what they told him. There was a pretty nurse with tired eyes and a doctor with grain hair and thin lips. He wasn't ready to believe them. Not when he was too weak to lift his head. Not when the hideous pain swarmed back into him every two hours like clockwork. When the two cops came in, he was awake and the pain was smoothed under a few layers of morphine. He made them out to be cops at a glance. His instincts weren't so dull that he didn't recognize the walk, the shoes, the eyes. He didn't need the identification they flashed at him. Got a smoke filled passes him. Ask it of everyone who passed through. He had a low grade desperation for nicotine, even though he doubted he could manage to suck on a cigarette. You're too young to smoke. First cop pasted on an amphibious smile and stationed himself on the side of the bed. A good cop built out wearily. I'm getting older every minute. You're lucky to be alive. The second cop kept his face hard as he pulled out a notebook. And the bad cop pilped the side of it. He was nearly amused. That's what they keep telling me. So, what the hell happened? You tell us. Bad cop poised his pencil over a page of his paper. I got the, sh I got the shit shot out of me. What were you doing on the street? I think I was going home. He already decided how to play it. And let his eyes close. I can't remember exactly. I've been... At the movies, he made it a question opening his eyes. He could see Bad Cop wasn't going to buy it, but but what could they do? What movie did you see? Who were you with? Look, I don't know. It's all messed up. One minute I was walking, next I was lying face down. Just tell us what you remember. Good cop laid a hand on Bill. Take your time. It happened fast. I heard shots. Must have been shots. Somebody was screaming. It was like something exploded in my chest. That much was pretty close to the truth. Did you see a car? Did you see the shooter? Both were etched like acid on Stillman's brain. I think I saw a car. Dark color. A flash! He belonged to the flames. Philip shifted his gaze back. I hang with him sometimes. Three of the bodies were scraped off the street were members of the tribe. They weren't as lucky as you. The flames in the tribe have a lot of bad blood between them. So I've heard. You took, you took two bullets, Phil. Good cop settled his face into concerned lines. Another inch out of the way, you'd have been dead before you hit the pavement. You look like a smart kid. A smart kid doesn't fool himself into believing he needs to be loyal to assholes. I didn't see anything. It wasn't loyalty. It was survival. He rolled over. He was dead. <laughs> you had over 200 in your wallet. Philip shrugged. Gretton and us moved, stirred up because of pain. Yeah, well, maybe I can pay my bill here at the Hilton. Don't smart mouth me, you little punk. Bad cop lean over, but I see you kind every fucking day. You're not out of the system 20 hours before you end up bleeding in the gutter. Philip didn't flinch. He's getting shot a violation of my parole. Where'd you get that money? I don't remember. You were dug in. You were down drug city to school. Did you find any drugs on me? Maybe we did. You wouldn't remember, would you? Good one. Philip Muse. I could sure as hell use some now. He's off a little. Good cop, should feet. Look, son. You cooperate and we'll pay square with you. You've been in and out of the system enough to know how it works. If the system works, I wouldn't be here, would I? You can't do anything to me that hasn't been done. For Christ's sakes. If I'd known something was going down, I wouldn't have been there. 
to send this disturbance out in the hall, took the cop's attention away. Philip merely closed his eyes. He recognized the voice raised in bitter fury. Stone was his first and last thought, and when she stumbled into the room, he opened his eyes and saw that he'd been right on target. She dressed up for the visit, he noted. Her yellow hair was teased and sprayed in suspicion, and she put on full makeup. Under it, she might have been a pretty woman, but the mask was hard and tough. Her body was good. It was what kept her in business. Strippers who moonlighted as hookers need a good package. She spilled on a halter and jeans and clicked her way over the bed on three hand shields. Who the hell do you think is going to pay for this? You're nothing but trouble. Hi, Mom. Nice to see you, too. Don't you sass me. Got cops coming to, to the door because of you. I'm sick of it. She flashed a look at the man on the other side of the bed. Like her son, she recognized cop. He's almost 14 years old. I'm done with him. He ain't coming back to me this time. I ain't hope having cops and social workers breathing down my neck anymore. She shrugged off the nurse who hustled to grab her. Then leaned over the bed. Who the hell didn't you? Why the hell didn't you just die? I don't know. Philip so calmly. I tried. You've never been any good. She hissed that good cop when he pulled her back. Never been any damn good. Don't you come around looking for a place to stay when you get out of here. She shouted as she dragged out of her. I'm done with you. Philip waited. Listened to her swearing, shouting, demanding papers to sign and get him out of her life. Then he looked at back up. You think you can scare me? I live with that. Nothing's worse than living with that. Two days later, strangers came into the room. The man was huge, with blue eyes, bright and a wide face. The woman had wild red hair, escaping from a messy knot at the nap of her neck, and a face full of freckles. The woman took his chart from the foot of the bed, scanned it, and tapped it against her palm. Hello, Philip. I'm Dr. Stella Quinn. This is my husband, Ray. Yeah, so? Ray pulled a chair up, side of the bed, sat down with a sigh of pleasure. He angled his head, studied Philip Brew. You got yourself into a hell of a mess here, haven't you? Want to get out of it? End of the prologue. <laughs>